Despite its stark beauty, the vast American desert held few attractions for European explorers. Native Americans, however, had lived there for thousands of years, adapting to its extremes, creating rich and varied cultures. But when the Spanish moved up from Mexico, they had a different idea. They wanted to find a use for all that land. They wanted to transform the American desert into a garden. To the west of the Rocky Mountains lies a great panorama of rock and sky. The earth turns red and rises into fantastic shapes scoured by the wind. These are the deserts of North America. Scorching days, freezing nights, and meager rainfall lay down their challenge to life. A desert is defined by the lack of water. Droughts last months, sometimes years, and yet the diversity of desert plants and animals is enormous. Those who live here are specialists, their lives ingeniously adapted to the lack of water and the extremes of temperature. But Europeans were used to adapting the land not adapting to it. They found long desert grasses that surely would feed their great herds. It was dry, but water would be found somewhere, somehow. Each successive wave of settlers refused to recognize the desert's true nature. And today, great cities stand in a land which has never before sustained such thirsty concentrations of life. The deserts of North America are a combination of extremes. Cold, high plateaus drop into deep, hot basins, then rise into rugged mountains. And to complete the seeming contradictions, great rivers flow through these arid lands, water that has supported thousands of years of human civilization. Ancient peoples irrigated their crops and stored maize and beans in carefully constructed granaries. In what is now Arizona and New Mexico, the Mogollon, Hohokam, and Anasazi civilizations flourished for more than 1,500 years. And then abruptly, in one of the great mysteries of prehistory, these societies vanished. At the end of the 17th century, a new people entered the desert to claim it for Christ and the Spanish king. Their coming was recorded by the Navajo, who lived in these canyons after the Anasazi disappeared. The Spanish brought the first iron to this territory. They rode the first horses. 
The vanguard of empire was a small group of Jesuit priests from Central Europe with a bodyguard of Spanish soldiers. They entered this alien land with a mission to bring its souls to God and make it prosper in the name of Spain. Moving up from their base in present-day Mexico, Spanish missionaries entered the mountains and valleys of the most diverse desert in North America, the Sonora. They were encouraged by the great variety of plants. Sonora is altogether a blessed country. It produces all plants, trees, and growing things which require rich soil and warm air. There are excellent pastures where grow the choicest grass and all kinds of healthful herbs. Sonora is a blessed country, but its blessings are erratic and come in hostile disguise. Perhaps the greatest of these is the giant cactus, the saguaro. It grows very slowly. The largest may be 200 years old. Its great capacity to store water as much as five tons enables it to flower every year regardless of drought. To the native people of the desert, the saguaro was so important it was considered an extension of the human family. Saguaro is our brother. His ribs are the walls of our houses. His wine is the blood we give back to the dirt to bring down summer rains. The big mothers stand there. The big mothers stand there. Whitely they flower. Black the blossoms dry. Red they ripen. In June, the driest, hottest month, the saguaro cactus fruits. The Tono Ootam, the desert people, harvested the fruits to make sweet jam from the flesh and flour from the seeds. This harvest was so important that it marked the beginning of their year. More than 400 plants could be harvested for food and medicine. The Tono Ootam followed the seasonal rains across the desert. They had learned over many generations how to live off the desert's shifting resources. The animals of the desert have adapted too. To cope, they have evolved their own relationships with the plants. These curious marks are the work of the wood rat. The wood rat has a way of unlocking much more of the resources of the giant saguaro. In the relative cool of the desert night, it scurries up a spiral staircase of its own making. The reason for the rat's architectural designs lies at the top of the stairs. Here it feeds on the flesh of the cactus, which unlike the fruit is poisonous. The wood rat can cope with the saguaro's poison and so has a seemingly unending source of food and water. The rat's staircase grows nightly. Eventually, the wood rat will kill the cactus as it gathers the resources that the saguaro's poison has failed to guard. This is a land where the needs of life are hard won and defended with spines and poisons. Hot countries are particularly plagued by poisonous animals. In Sonora, they are so numerous that it can almost be said that hidden murderers sit under every stone. The rattlesnake is potentially lethal. It was linked in the priest's minds with the devil. It was a sign of the challenge before them that Satan incarnate, the western diamondback rattlesnake, was venerated by the desert tribes. 
Rattlesnake was the most beautiful and gentle of all the snakes. But all the other animals teased and abused him. Rattlesnake prayed to the sun god for help. The sun god appeared before him and placed two of his powerful rays in Rattlesnake's upper jaw. Rattlesnake became the most powerful of the desert snakes. But in his gentleness, he always gives warning of his sun ray fangs. Scorpion is the Sonoran name for a little four-footed animal whose poison is supposed to be terrible. There is believed to be no remedy in the world for it, and it is said that he who is thus poisoned will be a corpse in a few hours. The Scorpion, or Gila monster, is actually a shy creature which avoids humans, but its bright colors are a warning for this is one of only two venomous lizards in the world. The Gila monster lumbers along on legs more suited to digging than walking. It's most active in spring when there are defenseless litters of rodents to be eaten. Three or four meals when food is relatively abundant can sustain the Gila monster for the whole year. The meal is more than food, it's also water, for the lizard never needs to drink. If times are hard, the Gila monster will not eat until the following spring, surviving on fat stored in its stumpy tail. The ability to survive long periods without food or water and profit from brief spells of plenty is common among snakes and lizards. The Gila monster will spend only about a week on the surface each year. The rest of the time it stays in a cool underground chamber. And since it's cold-blooded, it uses very little energy when it's cool and inactive. Reptiles were made for the desert. Mammals can't wait a year to eat. The ground squirrel needs to feed every two or three hours. The air temperature is 110 degrees Fahrenheit. The surface is over 150 degrees. Its tail acts as a shade. Too much heat is a serious danger, and the sun is a bigger threat to overheating than any amount of physical exertion, so the squirrel runs everywhere. The squirrel has adopted a strategy to handle the heat. After about five minutes of this, the squirrel's temperature will have risen nine degrees Fahrenheit, enough to kill most mammals, including man. It must now return to the shade of its burrow. Here it presses its body against the cool earth, releasing its heat into the ground.
The desert people needed to make the most of the ephemeral streams that followed the summer rains. In the north, lush groves of cottonwoods marked permanent watercourses, the domain of the Pima, the river people. With irrigation and floodplain farming, the Pima relied on agriculture for more than half of their food. Maize, beans, and squash were supplemented with wild crops from the desert, and the rivers supported a great variety of wildlife. Deer was a favored source of meat, and the Pima also hunted antelope, peccary, quail, and rabbit. But the abundance of the desert could shift radically. The key to survival was a variety of food sources. Trade between the Pima and the Tono O'otam brought together the fruits of the river valleys and those of the desert, helping both groups survive. But the Jesuits planned to bring a new way of life to the desert, and at first, their success was spectacular. Within the space of 20 years, 15 missions were established along the few rivers of the Sonora. Many native people came to the missions and listened to the teachings of the Jesuits. The Jesuits never realized that these people had something to teach them. They were locked into a belief that the desert should be transformed through hard work and prayer. But the native people already made efficient use of the desert's most valuable resource. Their ancestors, the Hohokam, had already perfected the most advanced system of irrigation in ancient times. An earthen and brushwood weir is used to divert water away from the river and into small canals that lead to the fields. The Jesuits, in their drive to improve their new home, brought new technology in the shape of the plow and mules to reduce the labor in the fields. Their object was to make the mission so productive that there would be no need for the Native Americans to go out into the desert for food. To create a stable community of Catholic citizens, the Jesuits needed to ensure that the native people could stay permanently in one place. The priest brought with them the new crop of wheat, which was added to the native staples of maize, squash, and beans. These crops grew quickly in the rich soils and hot sunshine. All that was needed was water. The best yield depends only on the soil being moistened at the proper time. Since no rain can be expected from December to the end of June, this deficiency must be met by leading water to the fields in small ditches, which task is not difficult, especially near rivers. The improvements in agriculture changed the O'otam way of life. The plow increased the amount of land that was farmed. The larger harvests and the additional crop of wheat did reduce the need to gather food from the desert. The greatest force for change, though, was not the crops, but cattle. The Native Americans had never farmed any animal. With herds of cattle, there was now no need for hunting. At first, the cattle could find enough forage along the hillsides close to the missions. But the desert grasses on these slopes were too fragile to withstand being trampled, and they did not grow back quickly after being grazed. In their efforts to diminish the desert, the Jesuits brought many European fruit trees Domesticated bees were brought over to pollinate the trees and sweeten a life of hardship. 
The cattle and bees were there to literally create a land of milk and honey in the desert. But the bees proved less manageable than the cattle. They swarmed out into the desert hills far from the river valleys. They were lost to the missions. The Jesuits barely noticed the loss, for as they prepared to celebrate the miracle of Easter, they were astonished by the miracle happening in the desert. The plants that flower at Easter have spent long periods as seeds, perhaps as long as 10 years, waiting for the right conditions to germinate. Rain, like most things in the desert, is uncertain, and many Easter's may pass before an area breaks out in a profusion of color. This great floral display benefited the Spanish honeybees, which had now gone wild. Along with the native bees, they perform the urgent task of pollinating the plants. But they faced competition from a creature so striking that the mission fathers were understandably impressed. One sort of bird I will send stuffed when opportunity affords. In this bird, one can recognize the wonderful omnipotence of God. It is called chuparosa, and like the bee, takes its nourishment from the flowers, always on the wing. When I saw it for the first time, I believed it to be a kind of wasp. Wrens and wood mice are large in comparison with it, yet it has a complete bird shape. The plants must be pollinated and set seed before they wilt and die in the heat. Their seeds will be dormant in the dry desert soil for years, awaiting the next mild, wet winter. The perennial plants show the strongest strategies for life in the desert, for they must survive year after year of drought and heat. The brittle bush does not blossom until the Easter flower show is over, so it does not have to compete for attention. The brittle bush's flowers are a tasty meal for the large chuckwalla lizard. This creature emerges in April into a world of yellow flowers that seem to trigger feeding. Like many vegetarian animals, the chuckwalla's flesh tastes good, and the lizard was in turn an important source of protein to the desert people before the arrival of cattle. The ocotillo, like most desert perennials, is very slow growing. A large one can be over 100 years old. Leaves naturally lose water, and so the ocotillo has very small ones and protects this precious investment with large thorns. The Tono Ootam believed the ocotillo was full of power. They used it to beat the walls of houses to drive away sickness. They believed its branches were alive with rainstorms. Reach the glossy ocotillo. It is not to be approached slowly. It sounds. Inside it rumbles. Inside it really hoots. Inside it really thunders. Inside it really sizzles. Illness was swept away with the stems of the Choya cactus. Its spines are barbed, and they hook immediately into anything they touch.
The Choya spines protect its green water-filled stems from the drying rays of the sun. If they are even lightly brushed by passing animals or people, they bury themselves in the flesh and break free of the cactus. They're called the jumping choya for this painful method of defense. In the desert, creatures must find ways to profit from the most unlikely circumstances. The cactus wren uses the jumping choya's formidable spines to its own advantage. The youngsters have few concerns about predators within their spiny fortress. If a human touches these spines, they will have to be torn out of the flesh, but the adult cactus wren seems oblivious to them. Its feathers and hard, scaly legs shield it. The tiny cactus wren is a great success in the desert. Its breeding is timed to benefit from the swarms of insects that feed on the Easter flowers. In a good season, it will raise as many as three broods of youngsters. The wrens have another useful trick. They're able to reabsorb water vapor within their nasal passages, water that would otherwise be lost through breathing. The Jesuits were importing a way of life that had been developed in very different lands replacing the specialized life of the desert with their own crops and livestock. Huge herds of cattle built up around the missions. The native people, recognizing the value of the new animals, rapidly became expert horsemen to round them up. In fact, the first cowboys were Indians. Cattle soon trample the fragile soils to dust and consume the sparse vegetation. Instead of abolishing the desert, the Jesuits were magnifying it. The cattle attracted native peoples to the missions, but there were some who took advantage of this situation in a different way. The Apaches clung tenaciously to their nomadic lifestyle and fiercely resisted permanent settlement. They were raiders descending without mercy on mission towns and other desert tribes. Many missions were abandoned. Fields of wheat and herds of cattle vanished, and the natural life of the valleys began a slow recovery. Desert streams resumed their quiet, uninterrupted flow. These trickles of surface water, so vital to wildlife, also recharge the water table. The shade and moisture lead to an explosion of insect life to feed insect eaters and those who come to fish the rivers. In 1821, the Mexicans declared their independence from Spain. The old empire was gone, and small groups of men from the United States entered Sonora. 
It was one of the very few times that an animal attracted people into the region. And for the desert, it was an unlikely creature at that. March 3rd, 1825. We trapped along down a small stream that enters into the Gila on the south side, it being very remarkable for the number of its beavers. At this place, we collected 200 skins. On the 10th, we continued to descend the Gila. Because of the heat, the beavers of the desert streams had shorter fur than their northern relatives. This made their pelts less valuable, but because of the heat, the beavers were active and could be hunted through the winter. We advanced slowly onwards until the 15th without meeting any Indians. At daybreak, our sentinels apprised us that the savages were at hand. We had just time to take shelter behind the trees when they began to let their arrows fly. We returned them the compliment and a number of them fell. I was assailed by a perfect shower of arrows which I dodged for a moment and then I was struck down. Hostile inhabitants and an uncomfortable environment meant that this trapping of beavers was highly localized and very short-lived. Within a few years, once more, the desert was left to its creatures. This is a battle for possession of an apparently barren desert floor. But hidden underground are the resources that most male animals fight about, females and food. The Gila monsters fight at the border of the disputed territory and grapple with their poisonous jaws. They have a degree of immunity to their own venom. The intruder is normally defeated, but never seriously harmed. In 1849, gold was discovered in California, and one obvious railroad route from the east was across the desert. It was bought from Mexico and became the Arizona Territory. Once the railroad arrived, it became economical to raise cattle here and transport it to California. Or at any rate, that was the message of salesmen back east. The larger portion of Arizona is emphatically a grazing and stock raising country and is capable of supporting and fattening an immense number of cattle and sheep. There are but few localities in the whole territory destitute of rich and nutritive grasses, and at least 40 million acres of land is fully equal for grazing to any on the continent. But the great Geronimo led the Apaches to continue fighting for their way of life. In fact, Geronimo's rebellion of 1881 was the last sustained Native American uprising in the United States. But once Arizona became valuable real estate, his days were numbered. Geronimo and his band were deported to Florida in 1886 as prisoners of war. Now there seemed nothing to stop a major expansion of ranching, except, of course, that this was the desert. And the desert had a completely unexpected trick to play. In August 1886, ranchers watched the summer rain clouds gather. They counted on the rain to revive the overgrazed grass. They got more than they bargained for. The downpour was the heaviest for centuries. The desert soils can't soak up these quantities of water, and the riverbeds overflowed. These torrential summer downpours recurred for the next 30 years.
Arizona Daily Star, August 14, 1886. The Santa Cruz is booming again. A huge volume of water came rushing down, sweeping everything before it and doing great damage. The county bridge across the Santa Cruz was washed away by the roaring flood. The floods cut into the shallow riverbeds and ripped out many of the giant streamside cottonwood trees. The sparse vegetation left by the cattle couldn't prevent the violent floods from sweeping away the vital topsoil. The aftermath of decades of overgrazing and floods was deep gullies cut into the desert valleys. Where there were once lush groves of cottonwoods and at least the illusion of pasture, there was now a sandy wasteland. The ranchers had to let their cattle wander out into the desert to feed on the scant grasses and herbs. Grazing of a kind was possible, but it took 800 acres to raise one cow, and there was still the pressing need to find water. Ironically, there was water underground, too deep for most of the desert plants, but within reach of wind pumps, the ranchers brought in to solve their problem. This basic piece of technology could lift water from a depth of 50 feet at the rate of about 30 gallons a minute, fast enough to slake the thirst of the herds of cattle. Suddenly, the desert could be made productive. With the loss of the rivers, most of the wildlife that depended on the water and the trees disappeared. But some moved out into the desert with the cattle. The Harris hawk in particular made use of the man-made cattle pools. Where once it would have lived along the wooded valleys, now it made its home in the sparse forests of the saguaros. Saguaros provide an excellent lookout, though they make an uncomfortable substitute for the branches of the cottonwood. Harris hawks use the saguaros as their nest sites, returning each year to the slow-growing giants of the desert. From its high perch on the saguaro, the hawk has easy access to desert prey, but rodents can easily hide under the scrubby vegetation. To find them, Harris hawks hunt in small groups. This cooperative hunting is unique among birds of prey. The second bird may help by flushing out prey, covering a bolt hole, or panicking the rodent into a position where the other bird can reach it. Once the rodent is caught, the need for cooperation disappears. The birds that hunt together are often related. Most commonly, the helper is a juvenile bird, one of last year's offspring that helps its parents in supplying food for this season's nestlings. The nest sites of Harris hawks are never far from cattle pools. Water, as ever, is the limiting resource for these birds that have taken up a new life in the desert.
The Sonora grows hotter and drier as it flattens out into desolate basins. Much of the lower desert is covered only with creosote bush. Its roots poison any rival plants. Superbly adapted to its arid home, its waxy leaves retain moisture and reflect away sunlight. Its resinous sap deters insect pests. All except one, the creosote grasshopper has evolved along with its pungent plant host. It eats, sleeps, and mates only on the creosote bush. Its creosote camouflage is so successful that it only faces real danger on the barren sands below. Dangers like the voracious sun spider. Sporting the largest jaws relative to body size of any animal in the world, this non-venomous relative of spiders and scorpions makes quick work of any small prey. At the dry heart of the Sonora, the sand gathers into dunes. No plants, no food, no shade. Rainfall, three inches or less a year. Temperature, 120 degrees Fahrenheit for weeks. When the thermometer falls to a modest 100 degrees, one of the specialized creatures of the dunes appears, the fringe-toed lizard. It has U-bends within its nostrils and a countersunk jaw, both to keep out the sand. And large scales give the lizard traction on the soft dunes. It's always on the lookout for hapless prey blown in by the winds. Its stomach full, it overcomes the obvious lack of shelter in its own peculiar way. Another specialized creature of the dunes emerges in the evening, the horned rattlesnake. It has found a different solution to moving over the soft sand and a form of locomotion that has given it a more common name, the Sidewinder. The rattlesnake keeps only two points of its sinuous body in contact with the sand at any one time. Rare among animals, the snake has no home and claims no territory. The sidewinder wanders the featureless dunes in search of prey. The relative cool of the night brings out two other hunters, the scorpion and the sand swimmer. Both hunt by detecting vibration. Like a submariner, the sand swimmer moves through a sea of sand. It picks up and homes in on vibrations created by its prey on the surface. The scorpion, too, can acutely detect disturbance in the sand. 
If the signals are distant, it will run. If the signals are close by, the scorpion freezes, hoping the sand swimmer will lose its trace. But the sand swimmer has the additional sense of smell, which it uses at close quarters. Vision plays only a small part in the drama between these animals. The snake crushes its prey before swallowing it whole. All the creatures of the sand dunes have evolved their own peculiar ways of life over many thousands of years. Theirs is a very specialized lifestyle, suited to the hottest, driest part of the Sonoran Desert. But by the early part of this century, even the dry basins were being eyed jealously by man. All that was needed was the one missing ingredient, water. Canals were built to carry water over great distances to fuel new development. The desert basins had the one characteristic necessary for irrigation. They were flat. The water came from the Colorado River and dams in the mountains that surround the desert. The desert rivers that had fed the simple irrigated fields of the native peoples now were mostly just a memory. The water diverted from the few remaining rivers irrigated huge tracts where before only the most specialized of creatures had lived. A desert is defined by the lack of water. Now, the desert could be destroyed with water. A single acre of alfalfa, cattle feed, requires two million gallons of water. Today, 170,000 acres of Arizona are planted with alfalfa. Electricity provided power to pumps that could reach deeper than wind pumps and work faster. Fast enough to flood the acres of thirsty plants. Some of the water that lay hundreds of feet underground fell as rain during the last ice age, long before the arid regime of the desert had been established. In Arizona, they mine for water. And as with any mining, one day the ore will be exhausted. Water plus heat plus sunshine equals crop after crop after crop. In 1910, the industry expanded to supply out-of-season vegetables to distant cities. And as agriculture grew, so did the demand for water. With water and electric power, there was nothing to stop the building of big cities. Between 1940 and 1970, Arizona's population tripled, producing cities like Phoenix.
the whole Sonoran Desert region originally supported a mere 30,000 souls. Now the Phoenix area alone is home to more than two million people. There are swimming pools, and Phoenix receives less than seven inches of rain a year. Fountain Hills development boasts the world's tallest fountain. 600 feet high, it is a powerful symbol of technology's ability to transform the desert into a desirable place to live. Good morning, Zanies. This is David K. Jones and Bob Bose Bell. Jones and Bose here in uh, Phoenix. Uh, boy, it is uh, it is a mess out there. Take a look and see if this weather is going to be getting any better at all. Another pollution warning, I think, is in effect. Yeah, it's looking pretty bad out there. In fact, we got a brownout. Uh, record high temperatures again today should be up to about 114, same tomorrow. The modern city dweller lives a life remote from the realities of the surrounding desert. Water has made this a rich land, but water is alien here, and its sources are finite. The Jesuits tried to convert the desert, and their cattle extended it. American ranchers mistook fragile vegetation for a sea of grazing land. And now the region awaits completion of the controversial Central Arizona Project, a 250-mile pipeline to the Colorado River. Already, more water has been promised to the cities than even this greatest of desert rivers can supply. When the water mines run dry, when expansion outstrips the distant rivers that feed the canals, what then? Will another way forward be found, or will the desert be left to its creatures? The cities turn to ghost towns. Phoenix, back to the ashes. Next on Land of the Eagle. Eerie northern lights that dance in the midnight sky. Tall wooden storytellers that carry ancient secrets. Whale. Walrus. Bear. And Eagle. Here the raw power of nature inspires and humbles. Follow our continuing journey into the legendary land of Alaska, the first and last frontier.